Thanks, Laura. So I'm Sebastian. I'm the CEO of Expiro, and I work on our capital markets uh, practice. Uh, joining me is Chris LaCava, our head of product, and uh, Tim Baker, who's done a little bit of everything and is a great advisor to us as, as, we, uh, as we work in this space. Um, a a two-second introduction to Expiro itself for those who aren't familiar. We're a company that helps other companies build products for expert users. Uh, we do quite a bit of work that we call Product Factory, where we help companies build new products for both internal and external use for experts like traders and quants and, and risk officers. Uh, and we also have a practice that we call Expiro Connected, where we've taken a lot of the patterns we've found in building this kind of analytics software and turned it into software components that allow us to accelerate our delivery to market. And that's quite a bit of what we'll be talking about today is how Expiro Connected Finance answers some of the questions that we've heard about. We've done a lot of work in finance in both of these uh, realms, both li licensing software and building uh, software around uh, financial crimes, customer analytics, trading systems, asset management systems, uh, insurance analytics. Uh, across a number of really big companies and feel like a lot of our experience is, is now interesting enough to, to draw some patterns from and uh, allow us to accelerate delivery on some of these things. This is the second in a series. Uh, uh, last month, we had a conversation with a, a wider group of people. Uh, Tim was there, I was there, but we also had Chuck Dorr over from OpenFin and uh, Ravi Srivastava from IHS Market talking about a lot of the challenges that they're seeing in the increasingly sort of chaotic uh, finance desktop. And so I thought I'd invite Tim to kind of do a bit of a recap of what we talked about as a group uh, last time to tee up some of the concepts we're going to introduce today. Brilliant. Thanks, Sebastian. And thanks for having me back. Um, so last time, um, you can go on to the next slide. Uh, so last time we talked about, um, really, we started with the offering from the big incumbents, the Bloombergs and the Refinitives. They're very bundled products. Uh, where perhaps users uh, touch 5% of the content um, and they're charging a couple of grand a month for that offering. And obviously, a lot of those products don't end up in the hands of the vast majority. We talked about the ever-expanding number of in-house and independent apps being built by banks and asset managers and the emergence of FD3 standards to help make those apps start to work together. And obviously, we had Chuck on talking about OpenFin and about how they're taking that to, to the next level, building connected experiences for their uh, 250,000 or so end users. Um, I wanted to recap a bit more in a bit more detail about some of the major challenges and approaches um, to those challenges. And this slide is one that you presented, Sebastian. Mm -hmm. um, I've added to it a little bit. Um, so let's start with the cognitive load. Um, it sounds a bit like a medical condition, but it's not. Um, you know, I think we all face this. Finance applications especially are like hose pipes of information. That information is very often disconnected. It's sprayed in different directions. And what this means is that users find it really difficult or impossible to assimilate that data, to digest it, and then turn it into actions to actually do something with it on, you know, and, and they struggle to do that really on a systematic basis. So things get missed, mistakes are made along the way. So the approach, which is on the right here is uh, really requires a much more user driven and user focused um, analysis. What do the users actually need to do and what actions need to be taken along the way? Um, and based on the data presented, uh, what, what decisions do they have to make? And we're going to see a bit later some real case studies that kind of brings that to life. So when your portfolio is underperforming, the last thing you want to do is to ignore, um, ignore that data. So we talked about the proliferation of those tools, um, that while they serve a specific purpose, they, often, they very often have their own version of a chart built into them or their own table. The average financial services user is, is accessing about 40 applications through the course of their work week. Uh, but to make decisions, users very often have to combine inputs from multiple sources. And I'd liken it to a frog jumping from lily pad to lily pad. It's a very disconnected experience. So what they often have to do is they have to export the data into Excel. They copy and paste it. They find some way of 
perhaps manually typing that data, and then they'll build their analysis and do their calculation, build a chart, and then present that to uh, whoever needs it. So modern frameworks like OpenFin have been a huge step forward because at least the applications are somewhat synchronized and we're starting to see the emergence of some um, centralized points of, of aggregation. And the best example is their notification center. So each app can send alert into a single place. Um, Sebastian is going to um, talk a little bit more about our view of how that aggregation will evolve going forwards. So finally, the proliferation of tools wouldn't be an issue if there was some consistency between them. And while functionality is often duplicated, the way the, action, the, the apps actually work differs quite dramatically. And this can be look and feel, it can be the way menus work, how they deal with things like time in financial services, time and patterns through time are really important to, to, uh, to model. It could be symbology, what tickers do you put into different applications? Some applications don't allow you to put a Bloomberg figgy in or a Rick, um, but also um, how are um, trades um, recorded and how are those synchronized with, with, with time? So I want to hand it back to Sebastian because I know you're going to get into a little more detail teeing up the demos in terms of talking about those common canvases which mm -hmm. become the point, point of aggregation for all of that data. Yeah, thanks, Tim. So um, something we've observed as we've built these kind of applications for the capital markets is that there are a ton of really interesting anchor applications, as I call them. And, and here's you know a picture of sort of an OMS EMS on the top. Uh, there's a third party system. The one on the bottom is one we actually built for a treasury trading firm. Uh, we build these all the time. People build them all the time. They're big, they're interesting, they're complicated, and they have to be because they're supporting very uh, sophisticated workflows like placing large block trades and such. Um, but the data is kind of hidden inside each one, right? Both of these have a trade blotter, but they're completely different. If you were trying to track progress across both of these uh, OMSs, you might find it challenging. And we've seen um, uh, progress in the world, say, of OpenFin, where if you are able to get these applications, these anchor applications into OpenFin, I can start threading some of the workflows together through, for instance, this notification center. So if I have a busted fill on one of them or both of them, I can see that in one place and kind of start making some decisions. But that's just a tiny fraction of the data that's coming out of these systems, you know, these notifications. There's this missing middle that, that Tim kind of uh, alluded to where I want to be able to get the data together into one place. And, you know, it's no surprise what the default missing middle tool is. It's Excel and Excel is brilliant, but it's also limiting uh, for a lot of obvious uh, reasons. It's difficult to share what you've done and it's you know, tedious and time consuming and not everyone can produce a, a, an accurate or a visually pleasing way to tell their story. And so we imagine a world where like data from that OMS could be combined with holdings data from your IBOR or price data from your data provider, as well as other, you know, essential data into kind of one spot, whether that's coming from APIs um, or your own Excel spreadsheets in order to tell the code, uh, sorry, tell the story in a particular way without having to do a bunch of coding. And so that's uh, what we're going to kind of explore with you today. We're going to talk about six case studies quite briefly. Uh, some of them are, we're going to show some live demos of where we put together some sample data. Um, and some of them will just be pictures of solutions we've built for people but can't really share with you. And, uh, you know, so some of the names and concepts may have been changed to protect the innocent. But I think they cover an interesting variety of uh, business cases across, uh, you know, both the buy side and the sell side. Um, front office and, and middle office uh, mostly to explain how we can bring these solutions together uh, a little more quickly and, and deliver a lot of value. So before we go into those, a quick introduction to why we think uh, we can build these in a similar way, sort of over and over again, quicker and faster and better, um, because we keep seeing the same concepts to solve the problems that Tim was talk talking about. One of the inevitable conclusions of the future of the desktop is that in very few cases, will you be able to rely on one vendor to just have all your data and all your visualizations in one place, right? Um, there's, you can't do everything in Bloomberg, as an example, right? Um, or at least most people can't. And so there's an, an inevitability of federated data where I'm going to be absorbing data from lots of different systems. For instance, internal data lakes and data marts, 
files <laughs> like Excel. Um, a lot of people are working with uh, graph databases. That's something we do a lot of work with as well, putting together so-called knowledge graphs. Uh, and there's been an absolute explosion in the marketplace of data available as APIs, only as APIs. Uh, Tim, you know, you used to run one of these companies, IEX Cloud, there's a great vendor of uh, market data, Fintel, BMLL, the, the list is, is a mile long of places you can get data from to stitch together a story, but don't necessarily ship you know, their, whole, their own application. Uh, and of course, if you're an institution of any size, really, you've got a ton of internal data that you need to combine to tell your story, whether that's your internal accounting systems or internal, say, ratings on securities or research or you know, risk analysis, uh, your CRM system. Uh, and then, of course, there's a set of services. I, I threw Symphony in here as an example. They're a great uh, kind of community slash chat integration provider. But now what? So now I've got one of everything, and they're all brilliant. But now I've got one of everything. I don't know how to put it together and tell my story. So the step we take in Xperia Connected is connecting the data. And we can do this live through querying a lot of these APIs and uh, applications, as you'll see in some of these examples. And sometimes we do it live, but in a um, kind of an, in an analytics um, repository, like a graph database or a time series database, where we can bring all this information together to tell a story. And, and what we need to do there is configure each piece of data. And it's not a lot of coding. It's mostly configuration to teach us how those data sets fit together. And we'll see examples of that going forward. But for instance, I need to teach it that the price quote from IEX Cloud is related by the security ticker symbol to the accounting position you know, in my accounting system or in my IBOR. And so if I can teach how to connect the data, I can then apply sort of out of the box analytics on it and I can bring it all together uh, in one place. And how do I actually bring it together? That's sort of what you'll see with your eyes the most is what we call common canvases. So instead of sort of a one-to-one -one relationship of each of these data sources with an application that that vendor has provided, we sort of we see sort of a one-to-many or even many-to-many -many relationship, a many-to-one really, where I can take all of this data and put it into one place, one, just going from left to right here, news and events calendar or one you know credit curve uh, plot or one grid that lets me pivot my data or one interactive charting application so that I'm not looking at a chart from three different providers copy pasting into Excel and making my own chart. I'm making one chart from lots of different places. So those are the building blocks that we're going to show you and we're going to go through uh, kind of those six use cases. There's a lot of sort of technology under the covers that makes this possible and makes it uh, possible for us to kind of do this in a configuration first way, rather than building each of these as a, as a custom application. Um, but for now, let's just focus on uh, what these canvases are and what these businesses, what these business cases are. So um, the first one, actually, Tim, we had a lot of fun uh, building this demonstration uh, with you. Why don't you uh, talk a little bit about this one? Yeah, so, and you'll see this format for each of them. And obviously, there's a lot of words here. We're not going to work through all the words, but this, uh, this is really the warm-up use case, I think. It was one that we developed together a couple of years ago, uh, really to help spark interest and understanding and help develop these concepts, which I think have evolved incredibly since this first, first piece of work. As I mentioned earlier, desktop products are expensive. And even if you just want real-time prices and some basic fundamentals and data and news, um, you're not going to be getting it from Bloomberg. If you are, you're probably sharing that Bloomberg with 10 other people. Um, that's not going to be a pleasant or possible experience if you're working remotely. There are literally, I, I would say for every Bloomberg user, there's probably 100, 100 non-Bloomberg users that need access to this type of data. So the Xperia team took a variety of those data sets. Uh, a lot of them came from the IEX API, but they could have come from literally hundreds of other sources and built this demo uh, which I think is really the basis of a federated desktop model. I think it can be a standalone product, but I think similarly, it could be used by anyone who's building an internal app that wants to add some additional reference data or useful data around that. So if you're sitting in the mid office, you're doing compliance, you want to check a price or see a real time price chart, you can do that without wandering over to that Bloomberg or frankly, getting on the train and going to the office to get to that Bloomberg. So I think this is this is kind of the base case. Hopefully, it will uh, tee up those other conversations. But let's uh, let's see the screenshot. Yeah. So 
Here's a picture of it in case you're looking at the deck later, but I'm, I'm going to pull it up live. Um, I'm showing it in a web browser here. All these components that we're talking about are typically, well, they are delivered through web technology, and we're often embedding them in a standalone web application, but we're also embedding them in OpenFin as a, as a, uh, a delivery mechanism, and they're sort of better and faster and nicer in OpenFin because they're able to uh, interact with other components. We'll see some examples of that. Um, and if you've seen an OpenFin demo recently, you've seen these components, although I think uh, they've been skinned black. But this is just a very simple overview of the markets. I've got a watch list that I've set up here. You know, I can create and, and rename lists uh, if I'm looking at different sort of sectors. I'm getting a real-time kind of chip there of, of uh, uh, price and historical price. I've got uh, access to data to show me... Um, uh, peers and competitors for the company I'm looking at. In fact, I can go add some of it. I can do some simple analytics in this case, like you know, looking at the average uh, performance of, uh, in this case, Apple's peers. Um, I can get a basic stock quote. In fact, I can look at the stats for that company compared to its competitors, like uh, um, uh, stock price, but also you know market cap, volume, PE ratio, just a lot of the basics. Um, I can look at its income statement over time. And look at its cash flow. I don't think we have any value data for that today. Um, and these canvases are coordinated. So I can go look up, you know, a different uh, company and where I've chosen to have them synchronized, like between this news and events canvas, this company statistics canvas, and the stock quote canvas. They're all working together to help me tell a quick story. So this is a very simplistic uh, kind of view. It's made possible in this case, all by data from one vendor, uh, IEX Cloud. We'll see some examples uh, uh, next where we're combining data from multiple vendors. But one can easily imagine taking this information. And if you have your own, say, internal research department or third party news, I might be able to combine all of that you know, onto this canvas. If I'm rating someone's bonds, I can go pull up internal rating information and pull that onto this chip and see a real-time price so that I can use that in my workflow, as Tim said, without having to walk over to that sticky shared uh, terminal keyboard. I think so, the other thing worth mentioning there, Sebastian, is uh, you might think, well, I can just go to Yahoo Finance to look at this data, but actually that, that application or Yahoo Finance is not, or Google Finance, is not licensed for, for professional use. So large institutions don't allow people to access those public sources of data. Uh, of course, that data is actually coming from the big vendors and they've licensed it that way to stop cannibalization of their products. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. And so, you know, we're seeing a lot of interest uh, from folks that want to build sort of information terminals like this. Yeah, from those... Um, sort of choose your own adventure API providers, right? Little yeah. of this, little of that, little of this, that's all I need, but I need to use it you know, with the right licensing and everything. So the other thing we're gonna do for each of these is just sort of recap what you saw in terms of those reusable components. And I think by the time we see all the different use cases, you kind of see how uh, there's commonality between them, lets us put these things together very quickly. So for instance, here in the middle, we have a, 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 in this case, it didn't get very complicated, but a grid view that showed our comparables for that company. We have an interactive chart that showed the stock quote. And we have that news and events calendar over here on the, on the bottom right. And we've set up several list views to look at our watch lists. You know, the top one was set up with a list of basically market indices. So we can see how the markets are doing in general and the right one was set up um, to look at you know uh, whatever watch whatever watch list you put together in this case it was banks um, and another grid to look at the uh, the comparables and so really we put this together by just choosing these different canvases and configuring them to a set of information that makes them available um, I can also rearrange these uh, live uh, on the canvas if I like to kind of get the view that I want talk about this second use case which is really sort of this what we just saw plus plus, but for an even more specific use case, which is portfolio monitoring. Yeah, and this one, uh, for those of you on the call who are at FinJS, we, we went through this in more detail. Very much, this is uh, uh, much more of a buy side type use case, but if you think about it, this could be a junior banker or a banker or a research analyst, anyone who is focused on a portfolio or a list of stocks. Um, so this person, this persona is uh, managing a portfolio of stocks. And as any good manager does, they're spending most of their time tracking the performance and looking out for any events that changes their investment thesis. 
Um, a lot of people think that portfolio managers pick stocks. Actually, they spend about 10% of their time doing that. Most of it is managing the portfolio. So very often new information comes to light. The PM is on their back foot trying to assimilate that data. Uh, it's coming in from the markets, but they've also got to interleave that with their holdings. Um, so it's a great example of how there's, you need to blend that long list of, in, of external data with the internal data like the investment book of records and how much of this stock do I, do I hold? I think the example we used was um, Elon Musk when he announced suddenly he was selling a big block of his shares. And if you over, overweight that stock, you really need to think about what to do. What's my exposure? What's Elon going to be doing? How much does he actually own? Uh, you know, what do the insiders own? We'll see that in the use case. So the pain points are really about assembling that data quickly, combining the data, again, that would typically be in Excel, and then coming out with a recommendation or be ready for that knock on the door from the, your boss saying, what are you doing about that overweight position in Tesla? Um, so I think the benefits are obvious here. You can move really, really quickly if, you, if, that organize, if that data is organized for you and those logical actions are laid out in front of you. So uh, over to you, Sebastian. Yeah, so this is another one we'll show a bit of a live demonstration of. So um, I pulled this up here. Uh, since the market's open, it'll be a little more interesting, but um, let's just start over here on the left-hand side. You know, it's, it's a truism that financial users just want to see everything in a grid and the grid needs to be super. So we just call this the super grid. And in this case, we've queued it up with the first set of data. And, and this is synthetic data that was generated last December. So please don't make any investment decisions based on what you're seeing here today. But this is data from, a, from a, my accounting system. It, it holds information about my holdings and the value of those holdings at, at the close of business from previous day um, in, in a hypothetical portfolio. So th there they are. But to make any sense, of these during the day and some of the scenarios Tim is describing, I want to go bring in data from additional uh, uh, sources. So let's look here at IEX cloud data that we've configured uh, to join up with this information, in this case, based on a, on, on a ticker symbol. Why don't I pull in the real time uh, price and uh, in, you know percentage change in this case of those securities? And I can see them kind of coming in here live. Um, I can even pull in some information uh, because I know how my positions join up to a portfolio and how that portfolio joins up to a benchmark. I'm able to say automatically kind of in this super grid, ah, for any of these positions, I can show you, let's say the sector that that position is in, in this uh, funds benchmark. I can even show you what the target uh, in that benchmark is for this position. So now I'm bringing in data from three different sources to show me holdings, prices, and um, uh, benchmark information in this case. And uh, I can also then come in and say, sort of in Excel style, I can start teaching the system how to combine some of this data. So I can come in here and say that, you know, and, and I've pre-typed it here because it's a demo, so I don't screw it up, but I can come in and say, hey, for any of your positions, the real-time value is equal to the number of shares you've got plus the, you know, real-time price um, for that position. And now I'd like to be able to see that as an additional column. So I can go ahead and put that in and get a real-time market value of that position that's now sort of a further analytic and even see real-time, uh, you know, what percent of my fund that is. Uh, because I can add all the things up for a fund and do some division. So I can use some simple algebra or even call out to say quant functions, open source libraries, things that are available within, within the company to put all that into one place so that I can tell a story like, gosh, Tesla is 2% of my fund, uh, excuse me, is 2% of my benchmark, but seems to be 18% of my fund today, right? How and why did that happen? Um, there's also a real need in a lot of uh, financial cases to not just have a flat list. I may want to say, come in and look at the insider trades uh, in, in Tim's example, where we wonder what the heck is uh, Elon Musk doing with his Tesla shares. I can come out to yet another data provider here, Fintel, and show uh, insider trade filings from that provider joined up to this holdings data, all in the context of the same place, so I can do my investigations in one place. So I've, I've just sort of walked through four different data sources here in one place. And of course, that's great that it's all on one grid, but you know, I almost certainly, 
you can tell it's a demo. You can, you can, you almost certainly also want to see some of that information on uh, a chart. So let's look at the interactive chart here. Um, here's the historical performance of Tesla. In the same way, I wanted to see some of that uh, other information here. I may want to add it over here. Let's add my trades to this chart. And now data from that accounting system is available so I can see what my buys and sells were over the last two years or whatever I choose down here in this chooser. I also may want to look at some of those characteristics that I've computed or are available over time so that, for instance, I can now see what the allocation within my benchmark was, the yellow line, and what the allocation was in my actual fund, the blue line. Um, I might also start comparing that to some of the news that's available uh, for, for that company so that I can get to that story that Tim described, get off my back foot and describe why, yes, I am massively overweight in Tesla for reasons X, Y, and Z. And you can see when things happened and why I do or don't want to continue to be uh, in that position. So just one, just one observation, yeah. Sebastian. I, you know, I obviously was working with you guys as you were building this. It was incredible when I, I think I said to you, um, it'd be great to have those insider trades. Um, I know this company called Fintel. And within a day, you had that working. I mean, I think the amazing thing here is that you're not building a big data lake to store all this stuff. Obviously, you've got, you know, the eyeball data, the static data, but you're literally hitting those APIs on the fly and pulling that data and building things really, really quickly um, because of these powerful APIs that are now available. That's right. Yeah. And, and that gets to this sort of connected data concept where once we know how to connect the data together, in that case, insider trades related to the particular uh, security that was represented in the holding, it just made sense to show up as a detail uh, uh, inside that grid. And we didn't have to do too much thinking about how to present it because we basically said, well, uh, if it's available as tabular data, then it joins here and there's multiple entries per security. So it's going to be a little child grid and you just yeah. pop it up, see it right there, see aggregates about it inside that super grid pattern here which you know, in this case would really be thought of as a holdings grid or a holdings blotter or something. And same with that interactive chart. We didn't have to think too much about how to show some of that information on a chart because we know that if you can place it at a point in time and associate it with, in this case, a price, whatever's on that Y axis or a percentage, uh, then it should just show up there, right? And so I can now mix lots and lots of data in there without having to think about how to present it because we've kind of put the work in on, on presenting it cleanly. Uh, we didn't dive into it in, in today's demo, but I've also got control over the context that I'm showing. You saw me focus specifically on Tesla. I might zoom out to see all my funds, might zoom into a fund. And of course, absolutely global to most of these use cases is time. I'm going to want to look at the last one day, one minute, one month, one quarter, one year, right? Um, and, and have that chart uh, interact differently depending upon sort of what time horizon I'm looking at. And we'll see a nice example of that uh, soon when we talk about um, trade compliance. Yeah, Which up now. Finally. So yeah, I really love this use case because I think it does kind of accentuate this importance of zeroing in right down into a tiny slice of data. So this is much more of a mid office use case, um, you know, on the risk side of things. So the portfolio manager is making the money, but if the traders screw up or do something wrong, it takes that takes that alpha away. Um, so this is post-trade, um, so after the trade has been made, and it's really part of the surveillance workflow and work that compliance departments do, especially at banks, but also at large, large asset managers. So trade surveillance has always been problematic because it requires you to pull in lots of data from lots of different sources, and then to identify the time frame and then put them all on that timeline. And as you can imagine, that is a classic kind of data munging problem. Uh, historically, that's involved getting someone from a tech team, a tech team or a um, you know, data analyst to manually hit databases and put that into Excel or into SQL, uh, and, then, and then put that in front of the compliance officer. And that might take days or weeks to do, and very often, you know, the head of the department or the head of the risk book wants to see that data. Why did we make that trade? Why was it outside the NBBO? Um, uh, so this is a really, really good use case, I think. Um, the data comes, as I say, from multiple sources, but the variety is even more broad. 
because very often you have to look at communications around a trade. Uh, it could be email, it could be a Bloomberg message, it could be a phone call. Um, so again, that's a very manual process to stitch all of that data in together. Um, very clunky, very expensive, lots of people involved. And the benefits of this type of solution, and there are, there are uh, what they call trade replay solutions out there, but they typically just look at trades on a price line. They don't integrate this rich additional data or the full depth data from a firm like BMLL. So, um, Chris, I think I'm handing over to you for this one. Okay. Actually, I think actually I was going to just talk through it, but, but yeah, you know, this is. Me I this mean, is an example of one where we we don't uh, uh, want to show the the live <laughs> system. This is just sort of some indicative mock-ups. Yeah, so the chart you can see on the left um, shows basically uh, this is based on the BMLL data, uh, which does full depth uh, market data. Um, you can actually see the bid ask spread. That's that that shaded area, and then within that you can see the specific trades that are made in the market and then the trades that the firm has actually made. I don't think I've ever seen a display like this. I don't think it actually exists um, in any product um, that's out there for sale. Um, but that very quickly allows you to see through time. And again, these sliders kind of move so you can step through time. And then on the, the middle table, uh, the actual depth of the book can be, can be seen in real time as well. Those um, swim lanes at the bottom then start to show you where the um, actual transactions were made, the buys and the sells, the email communications, any alerting, any news events. And again, shows how that data is integrated on exactly the same timeline. So a compliance officer can step through and see in what order certain events occurred. Um, the, the time slide is there at the bottom as well, which allows you to kind of zoom in and zoom out. Um, and on the right, um, there's a really nice visualization of what the what the uh, depth of the book looked like at that point in time. And that data is really, really big data, uh, but it's essential to be able to get that that level of granularity to be able to piece together why a trade was made, why it was outside a threshold, um, and um, and what the execution costs were around that that transaction. It's a nice example of how doing some of this stuff live is better than trying to jam it all into one common data lake, because in this case, uh, BMLL is is consuming, I, I can't even imagine, terabytes, gigabytes of data per day of all these level yeah. three quotes and cancels and order fills that have coming through the exchanges uh, in order to crunch some of these market indicators, which I could plop on my little chart over here. But yeah, I, I don't have to figure all that out. I can put together my kind of connected canvases to point to that API and just know that, yep, if a trade was made, well, like I said earlier, it happened at a certain point in time at a certain price. So I just know how to plot it on an interactive chart. And if I were to click on it, I'd see some details about it. If I'd like to see it in this swim lane view, then I can just pull it up from the different systems that have that information and, and show um, the times that it happened. And then, uh, yeah, this order book, uh, I can't even imagine what a large data set that's being fished out of, but once I've used the design patterns we've put in place here to navigate into where I want to be at a particular time for a particular trader, looking at a particular event, maybe one of these trades happens outside of the, uh, the official spread and is therefore suspicious. Mm -hmm. At that exact moment, I can see what the, the depth of the book was. And because I know how to, again, join the data together, what trader am I looking at? What security am I looking at? What trade am I looking at? What moment in time am I looking at? I can combine these things uh, together to help me tell my story. And just again, to sort of deconstruct this, it's built of the same canvases we're building everywhere else. And of course, for different clients, we skin them differently with you know, different colors and fonts and stuff, but they're, they're the same. I have a grid in the middle here, which is a, the trade blotter. What are the trades that uh, are open? And I probably have a context filter up top, like filtering to a particular security, maybe a particular marketplace, particular trader, so they can see their trades. Um, I've got the same interactive chart we did a live demo of earlier, but with more and different information on it, like that bid ask spread and the set of uh, uh, trades. I've got uh, what we call the categorized events timeline, these swim lanes showing multiple interactions. We'll see in the future how those might be interactions with a customer. In this case, they're interactions with the market, they're buys and sells and emails with people. Um, 
I may be very interested in the news that was going on at that time. Is someone front running this trade? Is someone responding before news was available on the wires, right? That might be something a compliance officer would look at. So having access to that set of news here is useful. And then of course, there's all manner of things that get put together with uh, interactive charts like that, like that depth of book. So I think now we're gonna hand over uh, use case, uh, the, the next use cases uh, to Chris, who's gonna talk about some of the concepts he's been building uh, for our customers. So Chris, I'll uh, let you share and uh, take it away. Great, thank you. Okay, um, we're gonna take a look at a customer 360 set of use cases first, which at first blush may seem a little bit non sequitur compared to what Sebastian and Tim have already mentioned within some of the more um, concrete financial sets of use cases. But as you'll see, as we talk through these use cases, you'll see the same patterns uh, come into play along with the same kind of um, connected canvas component tree within the solutions that we're talking about. So in customer 360 or any kind of 360 app, you, you, you generally see three types of categories of use cases. One is looking at um, high level segmentation and cohort analysis. So um, community detection and, and, and analysis around uh, certain communities and segments within a, a given uh, set of data. You also see a, um, a, a campaign type management set of use cases around uh, once those cohorts have been identified, either uh, and analyzing and then mitigating risk within some kind of outreach or engagement campaign. Um, and then you see something that's much more granular where you're looking at a small subset or even sometimes an individual customer within a, a, um, a customer service uh, intervention or, or maturation of, of, of a set of customer accounts. So, you, so a great example would be, you know, someone needs to understand how expensive is this customer to me? I'm giving them lots of my research. I'm giving them really good rates on so-and-so trades. Is it worth it to me? And I want to understand those set of costs, bring those all together. And I want to understand what segment they fit in so that I can spend more or less time on them, uh, potentially. Uh, ah, I can now see, having put this together, that my FX book with them is really quite profitable. So I should continue giving them lots of free research. Um, around, uh, you know, keeping that business and maybe expanding my businesses with them, or maybe it turns out I'm not really making a lot of money on them at all. And they fit a, 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 a pattern of a, a bad customer or an unprofitable customer, whether at the institutional level, like my example, or, or a, a retail uh, uh, example, and, and maybe spend less time on them. And you'll see that it ticks the same kind of boxes that Tim and Sebastian were talking about, as far as um, challenges, but then also benefits. So be, to get a, a 360 view of anything, especially a customer, you're pulling from multiple data sets. And historically, that's a huge challenge. You're, you're, you're engaging with um, technology teams to stitch together tons of disparate data, cleaning it, being able to draw those um, uh, cohort analysis um, comparisons. <clears throat> and a lot of historically, anyway, that's, that's a, 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 a huge um, amount to to climb. But the benefits of that, once you actually are able to do that, is um, you can employ a lot of um, adaptive learning type technology to basically find um, uh, non, um, basically things that are, are, are that, that a, a normal analyst wouldn't be able to pull together manually and be able to see um, uh, different sort of um, connections between um, you know, different entities in, within within uh, the data set, but you can start to learn and actually detect communities that you otherwise wouldn't find. And so um, as we go through this solution, you'll see that there's a lot of um, a lot of ways to bring things to the surface within that connected canvas set of, of solutions that we put together. And you can start to see things not only from an, an analyst standpoint, but then also um, an intervention and, and risk management standpoint. So here we have um, an example of a set of connected canvases, and you'll see a lot of the same kind of themes as we as we saw in some of the more uh, financially driven um, solutions that we looked at earlier. Uh, in this case, we're looking at customers of financial advisors, and so they've taken a bunch of those groups and they've bucketed them into these cohorts. And again, that that cohort detection couldn't be possible until you start to pull together a lot of data from disparate systems and, and looked at them in a cohesive way. So. The top left corner here 
we see how those different cohorts, in this case, we're looking at our top five uh, revenue generating cohorts. We're seeing how they move through a maturation process of outreach. So they start with some kind of basic outreach like a seminar or maybe even a emailer or something like that. And they go through a process of maturation. And we can see the end result is they are bucketed in uh, certain tranches uh, based on their, their you know, overall value as a customer or um, or, or their stratification basically within that, within that set of revenue tranches. Um, and we've highlighted one of those routes. So we want to see um, specifically how uh, people who start maybe in an, in an outreach seminar, how they move through that, that, that system and, um, and the series of maturation steps to the point where we get over to where they fall within their, within their certain set of, um, of, of tranches as far as uh, you know, how they, how they drive revenue. Um, we can also see information as far as how those journeys um, uh, are completed within the different sets of cohorts. And we've identified a few here. Um, you, you can see throughout all these visualizations, we're looking at um, emerging cohorts such as young and thrifty, um, as well as uh, high net worth um, holders, uh, accumulators, um, as well as, um, late starters. And they're all gonna look different, differently um, from a overall engagement strategy. You're gonna wanna build campaigns around those to, to target them in different ways. So you're gonna wanna slice and dice that data um, quickly and pivot to see those different, uh, different aspects of those different dimensions. But they're all gonna have a common risk profile, which is um, in this case, we're looking at churn risk. Are they gonna drop off or are we not, um, engaging them in a way that they're going to continue to go through that maturation cycle. Um, so if we take, we, we take this set of uh, um, analytics and we decompose them into their constituent parts, we see a lot of the same types of patterns. So we've got a global filter context. We've got a set of interactive charts. In this case, we're looking at um, you know, cohorts across a certain set of products in the, in the bottom left there, or that flow analysis that we were talking about as they mature through different engagement cycles. Um, we also have a recommendation skew because um, in this case, we're trying to mitigate things. So we want to figure out what the next best option is when we, when we find something where there's you know, high risk bottled up in a set of uh, cohorts or maybe even a subset of those cohorts. Um, if we look at, an, at, at another set of those use cases that we talked about, another category, we may want to drill down to a specific individual or a subset, uh, a small subset of individuals. And in this case, we see um, some similarities and some differences. But basically, what we're looking at here is how a, um, a customer is connected to certain interventions, certain uh, engagements, as well as certain products and certain advisors within our network. And so a lot of times we'll use a network diagram to show those connections. Um, now that is bolstered by that same events timeline with swim lanes. So we can see that both in a, in a network diagram, a, a kind of organic set of connections, as well as um, those laid out through sequential time in that, in that events timeline that Tim talked about in, in the earlier use case. We've also got a set of... Um, of gridded uh, actions that we can see over time where this customer may have fallen off, for example, um, in, in engagement, or in this case, there may be an episode we can see on the timeline where their, their churn risk went way up and we wanna do some forensic analysis of that. Um, we can see how that churn risk, that composite score um, plays out across different facets. And we can even take that particular customer and measure them up against a highly engaged archetypal persona and see where, they're, that where there's commonalities and differences between how they engage and act within the system. And again, if we take this and chop it up, we're looking at the same set of components that we've seen over and over again now from a, from a, um, a, a connected canvas standpoint. So we've got a new one here, Connections Explorer, that we'll come back in a minute. Um, We've also got um, the categorized events timeline. We've got the, the super grid in a different um, configuration, but the same set of technology. Um, we've got a composite risk score diagram as well as uh, comparison charts and an interactive 
uh, time slider. So very much the same types of um, technology, but pointed to a different set of persona and different set of use cases. Awesome. <clears throat> so um, next use case, which we'll go through pretty quickly, um, uh, is an example of say a bank managing their exposure to floating rate, uh, floating instrument, floating interest rate instruments like a LIBOR instrument uh, that are due to be phased out. So there's a regulatory requirement that they monitor all of these, but it's really quite challenging because these instruments may be tracked across many countries, in many currencies, across many business units. Some of them, frankly, may be quite old. You know, I could have uh, swap agreements that are not just uh, two days old or even one year old. Um, and, and so there's a real challenge in bringing all this data together and, you know, uh, not only do I want to be able to do that efficiently so that I can execute my program of uh, uh, renegotiating or retiring all these instruments that I'm required to get rid of, but I need to demonstrate to regulators that I'm doing so and that I have visibility into, into where I am. And ultimately, uh, it's no good if I just have a dashboard that shows me how many I still need to retire. I need to empower the people that are renegotiating them to do their work. I need traders to be able to see which of their instruments um, are, are related to uh, an, an IBOR and then do something about it. And so we're gonna show you again, this is another instance where we're gonna show you a, a picture of it rather than the real thing. But the real, the real benefit here is allowing you to hit a regulatory requirement and allowing you to integrate data, in this case, a fairly small set of data, but across sort of a complicated organization, and then lighting it up with some of that market data so that, say, I can understand, you know, what is my total exposure here, but let's express it in dollars, even though I have instruments that are in euros and pounds and francs and who, who knows what, uh, and, and maybe even understand it in the context of, you know, say, interest rate movements. So, uh, Chris, you want to talk about what we put together here? Yeah, so um, this, this will probably look familiar, but we've got a set of... Um, uh, of measures that are looking at risk across uh, certain certain uh, trade desks within an organization. Um, and we basically are taking the inf the, that, that information and looking at looking at what their LIBOR exposure is because they you know there's a there's a finite time where this stuff has to have has to transition over. So we're looking at that by um, what the type of instrument is um, and and where there is LIBOR risk within those instruments, within you know, health portfolios, within, within, um, within this, this organization. And then we're breaking that up even further by, um, by what the actual currency is. And we're basically looking at where the most high risk is in any one of those tranches, and we're basic, basically seeing where those, um, where those LIBOR-based um, products are, are set to mature. And we wanna take care of those obviously sooner rather than later. So we're, we're basically triaging that list within, within the organization. Um, and so we've got a set of KPIs across the top that tell us um, just at an aggregate level where, um, you know, what the trend is as far as our risk exposure, as well as um, how many, you know, for example, entities and counterparties these, um, these things affect. And then we're looking at um, some, some uh, uh, you know tranche analysis around how that breaks up from a currency standpoint, a heat map on where um, some of this risk is most acute, and then um, of course a set of bridged information that we can group and pivot as we showed in other examples, and then a set of um, of list widgets basically to allow us to um, work through, for example, a work queue via hot list or a set of alerts that are pointing us in the right direction for us to triage. This, this is an example, Chris, where, you know, in, in previous examples, we were grabbing data live from APIs. In this case, we're putting data together into a backend where, where none existed. You know, these are little Excel reports that are coming from all over the place. And this is not a process that's going to be there forever. By definition, this needs to be done over the next couple of years. And so enabling us to sort of connect the data from those different spreadsheets into one you know, sort of time series database um, uh, allows this all to be viewed together uh, in kind of a coherent way. Uh, so some of the magic is happening on the back end. Uh, and then because we can just light up these components, it's, it's much easier to, uh, to convey. Mm -hmm. So um, 
we talked about what some of these different components look like. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, a lot of these, uh, well, all of these components are, are available inside OpenFin. And uh, this is a picture of how it could look, for instance, where I'm using this set of canvases to understand, as Chris was saying, where my risk is and understanding how to pivot that data against some of data like real-time currencies or, or holdings values. But on the desktop of a trader. They don't need the whole organizational dashboard that needs to be presented for regulatory compliance. They need to know how their trades fit into this picture. So they're going to be using those context choosers not to surf departments and currencies, but they're going to say, my trades, I want to see them. And what's in the background, their OMS and EMS, where they're making those trades. Uh, Excel uh, on the right is, uh, you know, maybe the OpenFin notification center where alerts that are coming up from this system as data is ingested and highlighting risk. Um, I'm also seeing alerts from my system, uh, or my other systems I'm using like that OMS uh, or EMS uh, to execute trades. So um, uh, it, same picture, but inside OpenFin. So now we're not only delivering this kind of common place to show data, we're bringing it into that overall front office uh, workflow that OpenFin enables for a classic persona uh, like a trader, where they can integrate multiple apps through actions, which OpenFin is really excellent at, but then also integrate data through data and visualizations, which is, which is what we're bringing to the table. All right, I think we've got um, two more examples. We'll go through this one real quick, uh, Chris. Yep. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll go through this one quick. But um, uh, this is a very similar risk analysis. But in this case, we're looking at non-financial risk in trade desks. And non-financial risk basically means all the risk surrounding a trader minus um, the the risks inherent in in market uh, fluctuations. So uh, anything around compliance or other behavioral points that we want to basically say we may have some compliance risk within a within a, a cohort of, of traders. So um, this is interesting because uh, it allows you to look at some trends and proactive uh, mitigation strategies to get at some of that compliance. It's in a lot of ways, it's going to sound like the customer 360 view, and you'll see very similar components in the pictures. Um, but starts with the dashboard here. Um, and we basically slice and diced our risk profile uh, by a few different ways. We can look at it by division. So in this case, we're looking at fixed income and equities. We want to see how we're risky there. We can look at it geographically. A lot of these trade desks have different uh, risk profiles depending on where they are in the world. Um, we can look at that at individual desks. So do we have a spike in a specific a specific desk. That's what the bottom left is looking at. And then just an overall appetite of, 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 of uh, risk that we want to take on. A lot of organizations um, uh, have a very you know, specific set of, of risks that they're willing to tolerate and, and other ones that they want to clamp down on. And again, all of this is seen over time. So we're, not, we're analyzing this uh, forensically in the past or, or even potentially if the analytics allow us to do it. Uh, looking forward in, in projections. And again, when we slice this up, all the, all the widgets are going to uh, look very familiar. We've got a set of uh, queued up alerts. We've got a series of interactive charts. We're seeing that over time with a global context. Um, we can drill in, and then we start to see uh, risk by business. We see that heat map component come into play again. And then we see some of the specific categories of non-financial risk that make up that overall appetite threshold uh, composite score. Um, so we've got operational behaviors, we've got financial risk profile, financial risk of the actual trader themselves, um, conduct, for example, do they, um, do they get their signatures on their contracts and on time? Um, inherent risk may be where they're located geographically and, and other miscellaneous risks. Um, again, when we slice this up, we're looking at the same types of, 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 um, of specific uh, canvases that are connected together to, to build a solution. Um, then we can drill in and start to see the connections around uh, these traders. And so for, for here, we're seeing over time, uh, very similar to when we drilled in on the customer 360 view, we're seeing relationships um, of specific traders uh, with different businesses and different trades. 
and we're also seeing what that risk score is in, in this case in this selected trader here. I think we'll have a nice live example of that in a minute when mm -hmm. we talk about uh, our last uh, use case. Yep. And slice that up, we see the same types of things. So the final use case um, may be tangentially related to some of the stuff that we saw around non-financial risk, but we can also use these same sets of tools to look at fraud within transactions. And for example, um, a, a banking situation where actual fraud investigators are looking for uh, potentially risky transactions and behaviors and connections within uh, their their accounts and 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 uh, their customer base. So in this case, fraud uh, investigators are going to have to stitch together a lot of different disparate data sets. They're going to measure it up against some uh, outsourced, uh, or, uh, excuse me, open source um, uh, lists out there and some proprietary lists that may indicate bad actors themselves, as well as just looking at trends around um, around transactions, like are, are there are there is there high frequency of transactions? Are there transactions with sanctioned uh, entities? Um, is someone uh, you know moving around a lot of money, for example? There's a lot of there's a lot of things that we can we can detect there, as well as a lot of the cohort um, in community detection that we saw in 360 is applicable here. It just may be applicable to um, nefarious types of behaviors rather than um, you know, customers moving through a, a maturity arc of, of, um, of their customer engagements. And same kind of pain points and benefits. Hard to stitch stuff together. You hit a lot of roadblocks with cleaning data, um, but uh, the benefit of getting this under a connected environment that we're talking about is it gives you almost instant um, analysis to um, to, to connections that you may otherwise not be able to see. Um, uh, I'll show a quick screenshot with a decomposition here and we'll get into a live demo actually that'll show this, but I've got a few sets of, um, of uh, connected campuses here. And if I carve them up, you're gonna see the same types of, um, the, the, the same types of widgets that are, are stitched together basically to give you that cohes cohesive view. And if I go over to the live application here, um, I'm just gonna run through this real quickly. So I start with an empty canvas. Um, I've got my timeline on the bottom here. I've got a map view in this case. I've got an, a network diagram and I can go ahead and even look at that in a grid view. But I'm gonna open up a case that I'm already investigating. And immediately the map responds to it. And I can see within the network that I'm looking at here of an individual connected to a few different addresses, uh, connected to an IP address, uh, the color notes risk score. So I can see um, how a highly, uh, maybe a, a moderately risky individual, in this case, that risk composite score is based on a few different factors around behavior, as well as potentially adjacency to uh, a known fraudster. Um, but I can see where certain sessions that are also marked risk, risky and maybe even addresses are connected to that individual. And I can start to traverse that information um, and see if they're connected to different case items, um, different internal accounts. And um, I can even see, you know, based on different parties and different, uh, and, and different um, sets of, uh, of transactions, what that, what that may look like from a, a, a connectivity standpoint. And then I can also use this timeline to play through that behavior. And so you see things are starting to ghost out and pop back in to the view here. And what's happening there is we're seeing that play through over time. So it's a very strong investigatory tool here, how we're able to look at the what the state of the connected data may be at a certain point in time and then play it forward and back to see how things progress and how those connections organically um, uh, take place and uh, be able to relate that back to, to a set of events uh, potentially that we're looking at. Strong parallels there with the uh, trade compliance case, where in this case, the natural view is this nice network diagram, understanding how a person or a transaction is related to other potentially risky persons or transactions. Uh, whereas in the trade compliance case, we're going through time looking at, you know, who knew what, when, and, and when did they do it? 
uh, but it's 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 kind of all the same, right? Like yeah. we're applying that, we're connecting the data together, applying those analytics to cluster it into pieces, and then and then just letting you look at it all together. This is coming from you know a, a dozen different data sources. Yep. And like traders, uh, investigators always want to see things in a grid view. So <laughs> I've got my visualization here, and I can slice and dice things at will from that. But I can also, um, you know use this use this table to see the same exact data in fact they inter interact anything that you filter here will filter on the top there nice well it's probably time to about wrap it up huh that's stuff here I'll, i can advance these so we looked at we looked at six different kind of case studies today uh really all over different financial institutions but all with a lot of commonality where we had to analyze uh sometimes deeply really federated data sources and help analysts uh, tell their stories in a common place. Um, we did it with this framework where we admitted from the beginning that data is always going to be federated. You can't always get it into one place. We have to know specifically, and in our case, be able to configure a nice semantic layer that can join this data together, either live or, or in, a, in a repository, and interactively run the analytics on it so that I can interactively run those risk scores that Chris is talking about or interactively generate that uh, you know sector benchmark mark uh, that we talked about and then let users tell the story by combining all that data onto these common canvases common in the sense that they're common to all these workflows so we've done all the work to figure out how to make them usable uh, but also common in the sense that all the data can be put onto uh, onto one of them and you know i think a lot of the benefits are, are sort of similar uh in, in these cases but one of the most important ones is there on the top left like we're able to bring a lot of these to market faster because we're not spending time sort of in the classic, yeah, let's throw a bunch of data analysts for it six together for six months and see if they can get it into one place. Or not spending the, yeah, let's design a custom application, which of course we do as consultants, we know how to do that. But if we can jump straight to providing the business value and focusing that you know, custom software uh, development, if you will, on, on just the new and interesting parts and let that storytelling uh, be easy and quick to bring to market. It's, it's, it's a huge advantage. Um, and of course, usually you're avoiding risk or bringing your analytics to bear to, you know, sell more, save costs um, in this federated world. And I just wanted to mention again there on the bottom right, that in many of in many cases, the nice thing about this is that if you can deliver it into that FTC3 or OpenFin desktop, especially in the front office, not only can you combine data from multiple applications to tell your story, you can also do it in that gorgeous context of being able to have all those applications um, kind of work together. So thanks for spending some time with us today. Um, reach out to us if you have uh, any questions. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.